Good afternoon. I think by now everybody knows who I am. I've <laughs> been talking a little bit this week. Uh, we saved the best for last, so hopefully the FAA notices all of our pretty faces and we get a little bonus mark somewhere in our box that we showed up to hear what they have to say. Um, but I'm sure they're going to have some very important news on things that we need to know about in the next few days because things are going to go very fast with some of the things they're working on, uh, really especially to the benefit from Congress, given that extra billion dollars. And I'm sure they have some closeout information for us to close out our other issues. But I'd like to introduce our panel, Arlene Draper, the manager of planning and programming branch for the Federal Aviation, Mike Williams, manager of Phoenix Airport's district office, Lori Suttmeyer, assistant manager, San Francisco Airport district office. And before we get started, we need to thank our sponsors for this session, Jvation, CSHQA Architects, and Erected Tube. And we'll turn it over for their comments. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name's Arlene, and uh, I'll try and be uh, brief as possible, but I'm sure there's gonna be some questions, so let's get underway. Okay, a um, few things we're gonna discuss today is the supplemental funding. Is this, I thought we were gonna discuss this. Okay. We will discuss it. Okay, we're gonna talk about the AIP funding uh, as it relates to the supplemental funding. The conversation is basically going to be based on the $1 billion supplemental funding funding because um, that's really where we have to get the information out right away in a quick turnaround. Also discuss briefly uh, vehicle pedestrian deviations, runway incursions, mitigations, and some program milestones for FY19 and hot topics. Okay, jumping into the supplemental, uh, what the law requires, the broad process and evaluation criteria. Okay, with that, um, basically as hopefully that everyone knows, Congress gave us a billion dollars for the aviation industry on top of the 3.3 billion for AIP. Just to be clear, AIP comes from the trust fund and the billion dollars comes from the general fund. So having said that, some things of note, I don't know if everybody has had a chance to see the federal register for the billion dollar supplemental, but I'm gonna discuss FY18 in detail and then go into 19 and 20. So right now there's a, what's considered a priority consideration list. And on that list it has general aviation airports and non-hub airports. And with that, we're going to focus on those airports on that list primarily for FY18. There's gonna be two milestones, which I'm going to get to, where we're gonna open it up to the other airports after FY18. So moving forward, Okay, um, under the airports that's eligible for the priority consideration, you see the numbers there, we're not, I'm not going to read those to you, but some of the things that um, you wanna, if you get a chance, please go online and take a look at the Federal Register Notice. What has happened today currently, we had to go back and do an addendum to the Federal Register Notice, adding a couple items such as a, a form, for submitting your request, and then also clarification of language. So when I get to that point, I'll go into that a little bit uh, further. Okay. Okay, uh, the supplemental appropriations. Uh, the deadlines, two key deadlines that you need to keep in mind right now is deadline, the first deadline is August 8th. We put out a federal register, I believe it was July 9th. 30 days from that will be August 8th. Within that time frame, what we're asking all the airports is to submit your request to the, your local ADO, whichever that may be, be it Phoenix, uh, Honolulu, 
uh, what else, San Francisco and or Los Angeles. And it's going to be key because we have a very quick turnaround uh, for this first grant year of FY18. The other deadline is for the NIPIUS airports. That deadline will allow you to put in a request for the billion dollar funding if you're not on the priority consideration list. So not all hope is lost if you don't uh, get an FY18 grant. Basically, the general difference is that in October, on October 31st, we'll have a new NIPIUS report. The status of some of the airports will change, and with that, the priority consideration list will change slightly. But this will also be an invitation to the airports that are not on that list. And so in general, not going into great detail, Really work with your ADO if you're interested in that funding, if you're not on that list, and they can better explain to you how to structure your justification so that you can compete um, with the other airports across the country. And speaking of that, um, just touching on it a little bit, where we typically compete regionally with the AIP funding, meaning we get a portion of the 2.3 billion for the regional uh, Western Pacific area. The billion dollar funding, we compete nationally. One of the things that um, is going to be a little bit different is that these fundings will be available year round, whereas the AIP funding comes to a close September 30th. So just to emphasize, we're trying to finish out um, the AIP funding as soon as possible and having said that, uh, just to kind of give you a parallel there, if you have entitlements and you haven't carried them over or uh, declared what you're going to do with them, please do so as soon as possible because basically it looks like we're going to have to go in and convert them unilaterally, but we want to know what you're going to do with your funds before we do that. So having said that, um, Getting back to the rationale for uh, this approach, one of the things that's uh, different about this billion dollars is where you guys used to go through the, and we'll still do it, the national priority rating, and some projects really did not compete well. And in doing so, that's the opposite with this program. You do stand a chance of if that project did not compete well for AIP, that you can come in for the billion dollar request. But also just make sure you have your justification structured well and there's going to be a form that uh, we're going to ask you to fill out. It's optional, but what we're suggesting is you fill the form out and email that in to us so that we can look at everyone's information side by side so to assure that everybody has the right information in. And in doing so, some of the questions are very specific that um, we haven't harped on in the past, but uh, it's, it's critical that you answer all of the questions on that form. One of the questions that we typically, we talk about, but uh, we don't stress it as much, be able to really describe your project, but then also be able to describe how you handled your AIP program because in some of the decisions that are going to be made, we are going to look at use of entitlements, how you've used them, how you plan to use them, and then also don't worry about if you've carried your entitlements over already. That's something that we can take into consideration. In addition to that, um, We'd like to make sure that we get everyone's information in by August 8th, so please, any question is a good question. This is a new program for us. Uh, get a hold of your ADO point of contact, or you can even call the region, because with that, I want to stress that the dates are critical for FY18. FY18, as I said, August 8th, uh, for your submission is a, a critical date, but um, just keep this in mind that September 8th, we're looking for the candidates that are selected to go to grant. So a very short turnaround. 
Um, with that, we understand that you know there may be some missteps or not understanding everything clearly, so I just highly emphasize, uh, make sure you talk to your ADO. So with the evaluation criteria, it um, basically follows AIP, discretionary funds, what we use for that, the priority rating. Uh, also, we're looking at the long-term stability of the project. With that, pretty much that's along the lines of um, the AIP. And as it says here also, the previous track record on project delivery. So just be very mindful of that. And here's the other key point, the likelihood of construction starting in the same fiscal year. So with grants, uh, supposedly trying to execute a grant for this program by September 8th, you need to make sure that that project within six months can get underway. And if that's not the case, don't worry about that too much because as I said again, October 31st, you can come back in with that request or you can leave the request with us. The form, as I understand, has um, an option for FY18 projects and then also for the projects FY19. Keeping in mind, this billion dollars is good for three years, FY18, 19, and 20. By 20, year 20, we, FY20, we have to have everything obligated at that point or else the money goes back to the trust fund. Okay, we've talked about the priority consideration. So um, one thing that I would highly suggest to you is that you go and look at the Federal Register. Uh, mm -hmm. If you don't have um, the link for it, which here we are, we have it here. It's been published, but it has been published again, as I said, with, um, with some additions. Once adding the form and then also within the form, we're going to look for the cost of the project. We thought we had included that in the first federal register, but we did not. So uh, be aware of that as well. Okay. And I'm going to turn it over to Lori. I know there's a lot of questions, but please go to the website and there's a frequently asked question sheet as well as the second federal register with the addendum and please work with your ADOs. I know it's going to be a quick turnaround, but we want to do all we can to help you compete for the funding under the billion dollar supplement. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, this next topic is airport safety, runway safety, and um, I know run incursions are probably not on your radar, um, but quite frankly, we'd be remiss if we came to a conference and we d didn't talk about um, runway safety. Um, so um, here's a little message on runway safety. We've, we've really got to um, put our efforts into attacking the runway incursions. Last year in 2017, we finished the year with um, was it 23 percent increase in runway incursions over the previous year. We've um, collectively, um, airport sponsors, pilots, um, FAA, um, the aviation community as a whole has been working over the years to um, get control of runway incursions. And for the most part, we've made a lot of progress, but we're seeing um, an uptick in incursions. And um, I'm told that, of course, we don't have the numbers for fiscal year 18 yet or calendar year 18. Um, but they're um, on track with 17's figures, um, and if all goes as, it, as we've been seeing for the last six months, we'll be finishing about the same as last year, if not um, possibly more. So um, we really need to um, put some effort into this. Um, back in, I guess it was 2007 and again in 2015, um, the FAA administrator had pulled together a call to action it involved, uh, it was a meeting, high level meeting in headquarters that involved um, industry leaders, um, labor representatives, as well as um, members from the agencies, including all the lines of business within the FAA. Um, one of the outcomes of the um, call to action was the um, runway um, incursion mitigation program. 
Um, so we've been working the last several years implementing the program. Um, uh, uh, the data, it's here. The data that supports the um, the RIM program is um, is actually a, a lot of the the runway incursion data that um, we um, really took note of from 2007 onward. So once um, that data was reviewed um, and the information was analyzed, we realized that there was a um, a whole host of factors on airports, the geometry considerations, um, where certain geometry or certain layouts on airports actually um, seem to um, be the culprit in um, a, a good number of the incursions. So as I think some of the airports in this room, um, I, I know I'm working with you on a RIM plan. Um, we're asking airport operators, even if you do not have a lot of incursions going on at your airport or maybe you're not aware of the incursions happening, Please take a look at your airfield, particularly if you're um, putting in place a planning study. Look for these, th this setup. Um, one of the, the, the key, it, one of the issues that we had found and we have corrected in our design are the direct accesses from aprons onto runways. We found that quite often pilots were expecting to come across a taxiway before they landed on the runway they're bypassing the exit for the taxiway, they're on the runway thinking that they're now on a taxiway. So um, we are now working with quite a number of airports to reconfigure that so as soon as you depart the apron, you actually have to make a turn onto a taxiway then make another turn to get onto the runway. So um, I just wanted to highlight, um, again, there's 13 setups. Um, we've got this information on our website um, we're putting a lot of focus on that, and quite frankly, we're also um, spearheading it like we did the um, RSA program, that this is a high priority for the FAA, so we are focusing our, um, uh, our funds um, towards correcting a lot of the geometry issues. So runway incursions, flow, it's, it's connected to the rim. And right now, you'll hear a lot of conversation, at least, um, within the agency, if not within your organizations as far as the RIM. I think that was, that was it. So Mike. And Mike will, uh, we're, we've, we've pulled together some dates for the 2019 program. Thank you, Lori. And uh, again, good afternoon. I'm glad that um, we got this barrier up here to keep all of you from rushing the stage. Uh, we, yeah, but not as fast as you used to, Joe. <laughs> you 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 kind of left you kind of left that one open there for me. <laughs> um, so it's important to remember, you know, where there's a lot of talk about the FY18 AIP program, the supplemental funding in 18, and those dates. FY19 is coming at us. Uh, those dates in that you know, new year of the program, we hope to, that we'll get authorized, is, is coming at us. So you see these slides every year. I've had the honor and distinction of presenting this same uh, PowerPoint slide uh, all five years that I've been with the agency. There is one small change. Uh, you will notice in there, there has always been a date at the end of the calendar year that is for the environmental determination. And it's always been the determination, but there's been confusion because we have been seeing a lot of environmental requests that come in on December 15th. And needless to say, that doesn't put your project in the best position to be environmentally approved and secure your funding. So you'll notice there's an, a submittal date of October 1st for your FY19 if you're working a CADEX request. If you have an environmental assessment or an environmental impact statement that's in process, the goal is still to target the determination of that environmental process by December 31st. But if you're talking about a CADEX, October 1st, 2018 is the submittal date due to the ADO 
for those projects. You can see the rest of the dates. Uh, we continue to target bid openings for projects of May 1st, so that date is still up there. We all do our best to manage that when, in the confines of the ups and downs and the stops and starts of the program. I can tell you that still your best way to ensure your project gets funding is to meet that date, opening your bids. If you have a critical project, in other words, something you've done, a lot of pre-advance work coordination with an airline or a carrier or a tenant, there's some special circumstances Please talk to your ADO very soon, very quickly. If you haven't already, it might even be too late for FY19. And if you need help in how to work that process, talk to Barney Helmick from Flagstaff. He can tell you how that worked with his project last year. And that means a good story that he's got to tell. He's not telling a bad story there. Okay, now comes the tough part. Oh, no. um, we thank all of you who came to Torrance in June for our conference. Uh, we appreciate all the feedback we received. The intent is that we will hold another conference next year in around the same time frame. More details will be forthcoming. Uh, how many of you have received the airport topics newsletter that we send out about every quarter? Helpful, valuable, enjoy it, things we can do to improve on. Happy to get any feedback uh, we can. We work that, that process as well. And the, uh, the item that, that Arlene is so excited about this week, um, so those of you who for many years have been traveling to the regional office in Lawndale will get the opportunity to visit a new location. The regional office is moving next week. It's moving about three quarters of a mile, something like that, uh, north. So it'll be a little bit closer to LAX. And you can see the address on there. It's a new mailing address, a new city. There's new telephone numbers. All of the regional staff uh, will be getting new telephone numbers. If you happen to be in an email from them over the last three to four weeks, you'll notice some information at the bottom of the email about the new mailing address, the effective date, and their tel new telephone number. So, um, I've done a move and built a new office in my career. I'm more than happy to let the region take this one on their own. But uh, no more coming to visit the big uh, giant toaster in, uh, in Lawndale. So, and I believe that's it. Um, we are here to answer questions that any of you may have. I have two questions concerning the supplemental. Um, the first is there a matching fund with this, and second is, is this going to supplant our AIP fund, or is this on top of the AIP fund? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, first question, uh, well, number one, the billion dollars is on top of AIP. So it's not going to supplant AIP, but we are trying to work through, um, at least this year, laying some ground rules, trying to get the money out quickly, and what does that do to AIP, and how does the billion dollars impact both programs, but it is not going to supplant AIP. And I'm sorry, what was your first question? Match, whether match, there's a match requirement. Match, okay, very good question. Okay. The, General aviation airports will not have a match. It's 100%. The non-primary and the small will have a match. They will still remain with the federal match. And um, on the supplemental program, a couple of things. One is you mentioned that the projects which didn't normally compete well during in the national priority ranking mm -hmm. were still the, the idea is that those projects will still be go be using the national priority ranking for it, consideration in the ranking committee. Uh, yes, if I can, let's see, explain this clearly. Yes, they, that will be used, but then also we're, um, with a billion dollars, we're going to also look at that project because 
it typically may not be able to compete well with the AIP funds, right. but may stand a better chance with the billion dollar funds. Right. So that's what you don't have now with AIP. But those projects, runway projects, for example, will still rise to the higher priorities just because of that? Uh, of course. Yeah, of okay. Course. And then um, the 18 funds for the primary or the selected priority airports, are, is there any, uh, the, the funds available, are they fixed or variable? In other words, is there a specific bucket for those primary or are just those priority projects or those priority airports will get the funding and then for 19 it's whatever will be left after that? Uh, well, let's see if I can explain it this way. Right now we have a billion dollars for three years. Right. What we're looking to do is spend a fraction of the billion dollars in FY18. And then with that, that's what we're going to use over the course of 19 and 20 for the rest of the projects. Yeah, especially because of that really tight time of having yes. to award and start the project during 18. Yes. I remember you're correct. Exactly. Honestly, we were really trying to focus on uh, getting out the AIP, which we're, that's still our focus. But uh, we wanted to do something for 18. so. We should have a little bit more time come after 18, and then we'll have even a bigger array of projects at that time. But 18, we're trying to push for September 8th. And, I, and thank you. Uh, one more, Arlene. Is that's sure. just for the 19 projects. Mm -hmm. uh, those won't necessarily be in the normal grant cycle. In other words, those could be awarded perhaps uh, any time after they're evaluated and potentially selected. Right. Uh, in 19, wouldn't necessarily be like for us in Arizona. Typically, we see the grants fall in the summer. Okay. Um, um, very good question. Uh, with the billion dollars, here's the, the, let me see if I can get this right. The billion dollars has already been appropriated, but AIP has not been reauthorized. We are paid under the AIP program, so for us to issue the billion dollars, we have to be working. So just that small little thing. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Question over there. So I have three questions, and they, they all relate, obviously. L Laura, you and I talked a little bit about the, uh, the FY18 uh, submission August 8th <coughs> and, the, and the whole list. Having been here, I'm hearing that there may be some little bit of a difference between our different ADOs uh, in the area. For, for someone who's airport is not on the priority listing. Are we still uh, applying or not applying uh, for the August 8th, or should we just wait till the October time frame? That's question one. So Arlene's gonna correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, the, the Federal Register notice makes it available to anybody to apply and they're at the bottom of the form, if, you're, if, if you are not one of the priority airports, at the bottom of the form you have to explain, I think it's um, that you're not a priority airport and what is the justification on why you're applying. Um, and as Arlene mentioned, there's going to be, it, it's a very limited window and there's going to be very limited time to review them. So I think as we had talked, Scotty, I was recommending that um, unless you've got, and it's gotta be pretty much a shovel ready project, so your planning, environmental, all have to be done. So I was recommending um, to Scotty that if he wants to go for the funds, unless he's, he, he's got all his ducks in a row and can put together that application, even then he's not a priority, Castle's not a priority airport, he's going to have a difficult time, or at least that application may have a difficult time competing, that he might be um, better off waiting for October. But the Federal Register notice does not bar anybody from applying in, August, it's just that there's preferential, that th those airports that are on the list are going to be viewed first. My understanding. That, that's, I'm sorry. that's correct. For FY18, it's the priority consideration list. And then it opens up after October 31st for the balance of the airports. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Second question, do the projects that we, shall we say, apply for when it becomes appropriate. Do they need to be on our ALP and on our ACIP? Uh, you've talked about projects that may not compete well normally, but can another project that's related to our airfield be on there that would not normally be an eligible project? Actually, on the, the Federal Register, it says the project does not have to be in the ACIP. 
Excellent. But does it have to be on the ALP? Yes, it needs to be on the ALP. The, um, but you, you definitely need it for it to be on the ALP. Okay, so on the ALP, but not necessarily in the ACIP. Right. Okay, and then the last question, uh, Laura, you talked about the fact that we've seen a significant increase again in VPDs or, or incursions. Um, I, I saw a lot of things that were up there. Is there, is there a specific thing that we're finding out that's, that's driving these? No pun intended. Uh, no pun taken. Um, I've been working with our runway safety office um, with a few of our airports, and um, it seems, well, okay, so first, I'm not seeing any connection, and I'm not hearing that there's any connection. And what I am hearing is that it's more pilot deviations. I'm not hearing anything about vehicle deviations. Mm. There might be some out there, but I'm not hearing any of that data. And it seems to be pilots and... Um, I'm hearing a mix of that they're either itinerant or they're students. But again, that's, that's um, based on the conversations that we've had in regards to two or three airports, not region-wide. So I don't know. There might be a, a different effect happening in a different location elsewhere. So just, just a thought, uh, uh, you know, the FAA is really compartmentalized in certain areas. Um, ha has the FAST team or the flight safety team's been notified of this to start briefing on it? Absolutely, they're um, in the conversations that I've been in, the FAST team is heavily involved, okay. as are, um, and of course, runway incursions, as we know, only happen at, uh, at towered airports, which just, <laughs> I have a tough time with that one. But um, the towers are involved, and one thing that we are looking at is, um, getting the assistance of towers if there is a known hot spot on that airport where pilots are making the errors, they're, they're, they're missing a turn or whatever, is there anything that air traffic can do to help out? It's, it shouldn't be an automatic knee-jerk reaction that, oh, we need infrastructure improvements. We, we can't keep, I mean, the, the, how many options are there left for us to make Im infrastructure improvements where we can protect against pilot error? So FAST team is definitely involved, as is air traffic control. Next question. Good afternoon, uh, Orlando Teller with Navajo Nation. Navajo Nation has uh, five airports, uh, two in New Mexico, which is Texas, Louisiana ADO, and the rest are in uh, the Phoenix ADO in Arizona. Now, um, we saw the list um, of the priority airports and we sincerely appreciate uh, having two of our airports in the Phoenix ADO uh, on this list. And uh, because this is supplemental funding, i.e. it's somewhat of a discretionary fund for improvements towards the infrastructure of um, Navajo transportation systems, um, so no, no performance uh, measures will be uh, used against these opportunities. Uh, let's say that um, we look at the list again and our two airports are not on there. We've shared with the list uh, to, with our leadership and let's say the two airports are not on there. I mean, that would initiate a government to government conversation um, between Navajo Nation and the US DOT if that occurs. Um, do you see that list uh, being affected by some of the performance measures that, um, that uh, we're trying to address with the, uh, from the nation? I guess I, I need a, can you clarify uh, performance uh, changes, or can you clarify that a little bit more for me? Specifically for Navajo, it, it would be the uh, drawdowns, the drawdown issues that we have and we're trying to work on and coordinate with other programs within the nation's government. And would that be held against our effort to improve the transportation system okay. by being on this list? Okay, uh, number one, if you're on the priority consideration list, basically we would use the same measures that we use for all airports, but that does not mean that you could not speak to that issue. If you're requesting, if you're, if you're, are, if you're going to request a project as being one of the airports on the priority consideration list for 18, and if there's a uh, performance I guess 
is that the question, issues that you, you want to speak to? What I would do, if I were you, is to talk to the ADO, because I, I can't answer it one on. Okay, well then, you know what, so that we give you a, a consistent answer, I think we can offer to talk to you both in a meeting. So you get the same answer and you're not chasing two different results, okay? I think we can offer you that. I know we can. Mike, thanks. Question here? I had a question on the appropriation funds. Does it discriminate against revenue generating projects on the ALP? We'd have to look at the project. Was on one of your slides, I thought ability of the project to enhance the long-term economic sustainability airport. This goes into that a little bit. How would that option be viewed? Uh, I know we had a discussion with the ADO about a property reimbursement, and that's a different track, but it could be an economic benefit down the road by giving other properties that could be developed. Um, I, I think that uh, what we had talked about and, and in line with this question, um, the guidance I've been giving sponsors of, of the um, few that I've talked with is to provide the information, I think that says within 250 words for this answer and 500 words for that answer, provide a robust discussion on the ability of the project to enhance the long term. I don't think that we are in a position to say how that's going to be viewed by the panel, because quite frankly, I'm not sure who or what. I don't know what the, anything about the panel. It, it goes, the information will come into our office. We'll send it on to the region. I think the region amasses it and sends it up to headquarters. Uh, right. Yes. So I think headquarters will be the one to be judging these, and we haven't gotten the input on what they're going to look for. I, I have heard to um, really put some thought into your answers, really make them robust, clear, concise, but don't don't give um, don't short yourself by just um, make uh, having a sentence or two and thinking that that you just answer the question. You may be, may have. I, I guess I'm, I'm giving you a conflicting signal to be concise and yet not within two sentences. But if you can really provide good background information, including data, I would take the opportunity to do it. Looks like Jeff is ready. Yeah, uh, not to switch gears, but uh, relating to the modification of standards, the FAA is giving very clear guidance for what is required for a modification of standards submission. And now with the electronic process, is that being streamlined? in a faster review process, or can you give any more insight as to what the review timeline might be once all of the requested information um, is provided? You know, Jeff, at this point, I don't think we've seen any um, change in the, in the timelines once the request is submitted. However, I believe the vision is that it's hopeful that that timeline can be, you know, picked up just with some efficiency the, of the process. Of course, it's always predicated on, you know, good information going in and um, what's the purpose behind it. So, you know, I, I don't think we can tell you that, you know, we've picked up a lot of speed with the automated process as of this point in time. But I think there's hope that as it gets better, um, some of the standards um, you know, the languages and things that people want to put in will, will improve the process over time. Just a comment about airport geometry and runway incursions. Mike and I have had this conversation over a number of years. And the comment comes more from an airline transport pilot with thousands of hours of flight time and type ratings in jets and helicopters. Why in God's name are we adding two 90 degree turns for Global Express G4 drivers to turn out of parking when they could go straight to the runway? Makes zero sense. Just a thought. Uh, understood, and I just have to respond. It's, it's the idea of the heads up. 
the, um, the, in the conversations that I've been in or what I've been hearing is that pilots, their goal is to, to taxi out. They're doing their checklist as they're taxiing. They're blowing past the taxiway. By the time they look up in that three second window, they've just crossed the hold line and all of a sudden they're on the runway. So the idea was to force a turn. So some of these taxiways, actually, we were designing taxiways that didn't come across another taxiway. It was just a straight shot from the apron to the runway. We've actually been building a turn in that taxiway, even though there is no parallel taxiway for them to turn onto. I know. I, know. <laughs> I <laughs> feel. Amen. So the We're saying with you. really is you can't fix stupid. Yeah. <laughs> I, and we hear you. I kind of want to add to Rod's comment and the fact that um, maybe we should separate vehicle and walking from pilots because I, I have a straight taxiway and I have a large ramp. I've never had a deviation off of the ramp going onto the taxiway to the runway. But I have been multiple pilots in the wintertime taxiing down that taxiway straight away and taxi right off into a snowbank. <laughs> and there's no turn there. It's a straight shot. So uh, if we get the pilots out, then air traffic control can handle them. And it may not be a geometry issue. Well, you know, Lori <clears throat> mentioned it, but in the uh, at least the rim focus planning studies that we've been doing out of Phoenix, by default, the solution to a rim location is not a geometry change. It is intended to explore all options amongst all the users, because again, you know, airport people aren't driving the airplane. So, and again, a lot of people look at this as rim as automatically we're gonna go in and change the geometry of that taxiway. And I argue not by default. Not without going through appropriate planning and engagement and outreach and communication with the users and ultimately knowing that that's the best way to enhance the level of safety at that location. Andy. Uh, yeah, if I can just follow up on that and just an example, and I think Arlene, you'll find this interesting because how hard we worked with RIM and solving some issues on our taxiways and taxi um, and uh, apron. And uh, Lori, you've seen the, uh, the end product, but um, back to uh, what you said, John, I said it earlier. Um, to my colleague that was sitting here a minute ago, and that, that kind of comes down to that. You can't sometimes fix those things that can't be fixed. Uh, we went through all this effort, and we have these lo beautiful green islands now. Um, we just, I, I kid my pilots and the airport group that, you know, we're up to ICAO standards now, but we still can't fix it when uh, we open up in, uh, uh, in an aircraft taxis through a double yellow line. I don't think they're looking, they're looking at this beautiful green. And so Tower calls back and says, hey, you can't do that. So they turn around and come back through. <laughs> so you can't fix that. <laughs> but it, it, it worked, one thing it has done <coughs> from the vehicle point of view, it works very well. <laughs> but <laughs> anyways, that's my. Next question. So when do we get our checks? <laughs> as soon as I head back to the office <laughs> where I'm working on it. Seriously, we are working feverishly. We had an update with the Federal Register just this morning, the change in it, and we are working to make sure we get that money out as soon as possible. Um, as you can tell, the deadline is really short between now and September 8th, and then still trying to close out AIP, but we are definitely working hard on it. Well, thank you. We appreciate your efforts on getting another third of a year program out on top of a normal program and the uncertainties that you occasionally deal with on your appropriations. We will try and meet what you need, but uh, we, Orlando mentioned it. So we don't always do it, but uh, we appreciate the efforts. Uh, John, I have two more plugs here for everybody. Um, first, we just, uh, as in 
uh, July 13th, released um, the airport terminal planning AC. It's a new updated AC. Um, has um, quite a bit of information in there. It's, it's a great resource, um, but I'll also just remind everybody um, that the, um, the AC is great for um, guidance, but the um, eligibility and justification criteria are going to be in the AIP handbook under the terminals. And then also um, recently released, I, I don't have the data as to when it was released, but it's going to become effective October of 2018, is um, an SOP for consultant fee analysis. And as I think everybody in this room knows, the SOPs are intended for internal use. But if you would like to know how we're going to be um, conducting our business, then um, I, th those SOPs are out there for you to take a look at. Um, th that SOP will provide guidance to our staffs in, um, as we review the um, con consultant fee um, letters and submittals submitted by you, the airport sponsor. So the consultant fee um, analysis SOP is out there and it will become effective this October and the airport terminal planning AC was just released. So that, I don't know if it's on the website yet, but look for that shortly. Well, since we have some new information, just wanna check and see if there's any additional questions based on that. My question is, if the new AC came out and you're already at schema finished schematic, do you now have to apply the new AC to a terminal design? <laughs> In my experience, no. If you're already in the process, then you stick with the process. If you're just starting the process, if we haven't gotten the, the, the grant out the door yet for um, a terminal project, then yes, you would go according to the new one. But if you're in process, no. All right, thank you. Um, with that, I'd like everybody to thank the speakers today. And also on behalf of SWAI, we've made a donation in your name to the Wounded Warrior Project to thank you for your participation today. And let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. Well, and I get the joy of wrapping up the conference. So thank everybody for sticking it out and uh, lasting all day. Uh, we still have some fun and adventures to yet to come today. Uh, tonight at 6 o'clock, the president's reception is out here in the foyer. Dinner will be in this room at, starting at 7. So we'll look forward to seeing you here tonight. And I really wanna thank TJ, Kelly, and the committee on this. We, they pulled off a very great conference. I hope everybody's enjoyed the venue, they've enjoyed the sessions, enjoyed the, uh, enjoyed the networking opportunities, and that it uh, remains seamless for you, and it was well worth your time. One last note is we will be sending out electronic evaluations and so we really encourage everybody to fill those out so we can get your feedback to continually improve the conferences and make the experiences better for you. But we also really need feedback on sessions. Uh, we don't wanna keep doing the same sessions, uh, but we need the feedback to know what we should be looking for at the next conference. And I'd like to turn it over to TJ uh, for his closing remarks on the conference. Thank you, John. So uh, first of all, I wanna thank you all again for, for staying uh, till the very end. And uh, I know it's been a long two days, uh, not just uh, all the sessions, uh, uh, all the networking uh, evening functions. I know even it's fun, but still a lot of work. Hopefully, uh, I see everybody engaged and, uh, and especially evenings uh, 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 getting connected with each other. So uh, uh, I want to thank you all for your participation. And, uh, and also, please thank Eric, Cole, and Joseph in the back. I, uh, they did a great job managing the <laughs> AV for us. And all the way over there, Gladys, making the giveaways fun. Appreciate it. Thank you. And on the way out, please uh, uh, extend your appreciation to uh, Kathy and Desiree. They've done a great job getting everybody situated, continue to uh, 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 keep us on track, on task. And lastly, I want to, you've been listening for two days, and uh, I definitely want to take a few minutes. If you have any feedback for us or any thoughts that you want to share with the uh, Entire group, feel free. Anybody? Appreciate it. Thank you very much. If that's it, I don't have anything else. Look forward to see all of you tonight. And Sacramento is.